Hello and welcome to a um, kind of an experimental thing, kind of a standalone episode of The Hearing where we're not going to be reviewing um, an album, but we're going to be talking about something in music related. Um, so, um, last at the end of last week, because I follow a lot of millennials on Twitter, when Taylor Swift dropped her latest album, I, I heard a lot about it. <laughs> well, yeah, I try to ignore it, though. Um, she dropped it kind of out of nowhere. A lot of people were talking about it being a departure. Um, so, and I, I checked out a few songs. It's, eh, Don't they feel... say that about every album she puts out? Though? Mm. It is a <laughs> yeah, step back to like, country roots. Um, 1989 is a departure. Yeah. The one where she plays goth princess yeah. Barbie for, yeah, that's, you know, but a departure. I checked out a few songs. I was impressed that she wrote one entirely on her own. Um, the big deal is it was recorded in quarantine and released, you know, as a surprise. Anyway, as I was looking through the liner notes, I kind of, you know, shuddered when I saw that she co-wrote everything with the producer. Incidentally, same producer as um, Mass Seduction, Jack Arnoff, I think his name is. Oh, yeah. Um, And, you know, everything is a session player. And I started to wonder about pop music because I'm not a fan. And I almost have an aversion to it because of how how... You know, everything has, like, 50 songwriters. Yeah. And I, I did a little checking on the history of pop music. And was kind of, found out something kind of fascinating. Because I knew it went back to, like, Sinatra and Bennett in that era. In fact, I've often referred to Sinatra as the first pop star. Um, hmm. Turns out that era is called traditional pop. Yeah. It goes back quite a bit further. I did a bit of digging. It actually goes back to the early 1900s in musical theater. Yeah, I could see that, definitely. It was one of those things um, I never connected, but it made perfect sense. We did, The theater I worked at had a horrendous, horrendous show. Uh, it was from the guys that did Jersey Boys, actually. Mm -hmm. It was their follow-up to it. And it was called Turn of the Century. And the premise was that these two hack songwriters uh, got transported back to 1900 mm -hmm. and they decided to write, you know, quote unquote, write the songs of the 20th century mm -hmm. and release them out of context. And of course they were hits regardless of not having context. Okay. It was horrendous. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there are two well-known traditions in music: the, fo the folk tradition, you know, yes. folk, country, bluegrass, blues, jazz, rock. It's music of the people. It's it, and and then there's the formal tradition, classical, quote unquote, classical music, orchestral music, the formal tradition. Um, right. So, symphony hall, the living yeah. room, and they both have their different value. Yeah. Folk tradition values authenticity. Formal tradition values skill. Well, folk is, you know, it's how people entertain themselves for the most part, you know? And then the point is to say your truth. Be yourself, speak your truth. Yeah. Pre-radio, yeah. you know, what else were you going to do? Right. Formal music, it's about skill. It's, it's you know, learn your craft, impress, be impressive. Pop, I, which I now realize has a tradition, it's about entertainment. And as far as pop for me, I mean, it depends on the genre, on the on the era. I think mm -hmm. you know, well, there, yeah, there I mean, are some I eras that are better than others. Yeah, um, but when you were shocked that I loved the Annika album, even though it was very much a pop album, it's because I live in the folk tradition, at least in terms of music. So I value authenticity. And in that case, it was written, recorded, and produced by the band, recorded in their home studio. It was authentic. You know, so I put the the tradition ahead of even this genre of music. Um, and, I mean, there are plenty of pop artists that, you know, they did have their own control of it. But, right. And there's power, yeah, pop, which I like, you know, and that's very much, that's authentic. Um, but you had the, the Tin Pan Alley sort of, right. you know. Well, that's the thing. In pop, it isn't about the songwriter or even the artist, you know, speaking their truth. It's about putting on a show. It's a package. It's it's 
entertainment. It's it's do what's entertaining. It makes perfect sense that it comes from musical theater, which isn't about the the creator. It's not about the the artist, the performer being themselves. It's about the character and entertainment value. Um, back uh, a couple albums ago, when Bandmates started writing their own songs on their their first full length album, just bring it. Um, there were a lot of us who were very relieved uh, about this. Um, in fact, somebody could have been me said, uh, you know, they're finally a real band. <laughs> <laughs> and there was this other contingent of people who said, you know, what do you, what does it matter who writes the songs as long as they're good? And in Bandmate's case, it's, it's, it's kind of a perfect split because, you know, they're, they're just as pop as they are rock. So you get, you know, fans who are in both traditions. And it was this inter this dichotomy, and at the time I didn't know how to answer that. Yeah, you know, why do I value who writes the songs? <laughs> and I realized it's because of these different traditions. And you know, I'm squarely in the folk tradition. These people who are saying, you know, who cares who writes the songs, are squarely in the pop tradition. Well, I mean, and I'm not that particular about who writes the song mm -hmm. versus whether it's the artist or they do somebody right. else's song I, I think it's more of is that song right for the artist you know uh -huh. is it a good fit um is it a role that that artist can play because i mean that's really how i always see a song is you know mm -hmm. an acting role that so you actually lean a little bit toward the pop tradition in that sense it, if they can well, so of course, if they're writing it for themselves, that's going to be the best fit right, possible, you know. And yeah. a lot of the times when they're writing it for themselves, they're writing in another character anyway. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, they're, they're very rarely speaking of themselves, which, I mean, usually when they do, it's kind of weird. That's, that's You segue to something <laughs> I didn't know if I was going to bring up, which is interesting. Because when yeah. it comes to music, I'm very much, I'm almost folk to a fault. Um, speaking of bandmate. I rarely listen to the stuff they don't write. They didn't write, even though I loved it at the time. I don't really listen to the first to the mini albums anymore. I, I stick to the stuff written by the band, with with a couple of exceptions. Um, with music, I am folk to a fault. As a poet, uh, JHM underscore poetry on Instagram, just for a cheap plug. Um, plug. I, I lean much more formal. I'm a very yes. I'm very technical as a poet. And a lot of times I, they aren't about me. Right. Oh, of course. I mean, I try to make them emotive and I, I'm very big on death of the author. I, it, it shouldn't be about what I intended. It should be about, you know, what the reader brings to it and how they apply it to their own experience. Um, but it's kind of, you know, it, that's just kind of an interesting dichotomy. And there I'm formal music, I'm fully on, into folk. I don't really think about the pop tradition. I don't think about entertainment. I think this might be why I never got anywhere as a creative. At least <laughs> part of it. Like, thinking about entertainment to me was always kind of dirty. Hmm. It should be about speaking your truth and doing what you want to do. And, you know, if you can be impressive, that's kind of cool you know, show a lot of skill. But I think I've always thought of it as a byproduct, which, you know, not the end result. No, well, I mean, if something happens to be entertaining, that's great. Right. I mean, I've always felt like, well, you know, I'm not going to be able to tell what everybody else likes, so I'm just going to do what I like kind of thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and hope that people come along for the ride, too. Right. But, you know, I never thought about trying to be entertaining. And, you know, I watch a lot of YouTube, and people who are very very successful on that platform have talked about like tr putting thought into like what is popular and what people will like. And I've yeah. heard other people in, in other mediums to say the same. And it always kind of makes my skin crawl a little. Yeah. Cause well with zombie takeout starting that early on, we had a lot of people say, Hey, why don't you do this, you know, movie or that movie? And a lot of them were just, you know, mainstream movies that had yeah. been talked about to death already mm -hmm. it's kind of like but that's not the point of this i mean the point is that we're away from executives telling us what we right. need to do and uh what we need to talk about and uh just 
go where no one else has gone before. And a, and a lot of people have said because of the name we should just do horror. Um, I thought yeah. of that name because it sounded like a B movie, and everything else I thought about for a B movie podcast was taken. <laughs> <laughs> zombie takeout wasn't that's the only reason we call it that we um, couldn't i mean uncle john's b movie picks just didn't uh roll off the uh well, i mean but yeah it wasn't just about me then that was the segment on the tuesday <laughs> afternoon show our previous yeah, podcast yeah. that zombie takeout spawned from right um but this realization about the pop tradition and making it about entertainment gave me a whole new spin on that because making something entertaining isn't necessarily a cash grab uh, it's not an easy thing to do either. I well, mean, it's not, well, yeah, I mean, it takes skill, but it's it's really about you know giving people something to to enjoy. It's not just yeah. the soulless, cynical cash grab that I've always characterized <laughs> it as. It, the problem is, by the time we're seeing it, usually it is just the soulless cash well, grab. In, in most mainstream cases, yes, but yeah. you know, something could appear main appear authentic, and and still be a cynical, soulless cash grab. <laughs> <laughs> that just uh, not only did I not realize 35 years as a musician not realize that there was this third tradition in music that I knew nothing about and, and knew nothing about where it went back to I mean obviously musical theater spawned from um, yeah you know uh, uh, opera and probably something in the, on the folk side minstrel shows and sort of that sort of thing if you think about it it's kind of a combination of opera and folk you know this whole and and classical, where they're just you know showboat, you know oh, yeah. things well, like they that. They pull a lot from them. from you know classical music and from pop mu- and from folk music. Um, classical pulls from folk all the time. Um, in the in the documentary about Punch Brothers we did last week, uh, Chris Thiele talked about merging folk and formal. Yeah, he was not the first to do that. He may be the first in bluegrass, but Zappa did that. He was really more on the formal side himself. Well, right, that was the whole point of progressive rock yeah, in the early Prague 70s. Yeah, was a mix of folk, is a mix of folk and formal. Jazz, in a lot of ways, is a mix of folk and formal. Well, and if you think about it, pop really came, you know, from ragtime and jazz, yeah. which, you know, jazz... Well, a lot of jazz was a big influence because jazz was the popular music of the day. Right. In the Up until the 50s, jazz was the thing. Jazz was popular music, just was, you know, the big music of the day. Rock and roll came along and killed it. Or maybe the R&B. You get more like the swing, you know, and, yeah. you know. R&B and country got big and other styles came along and killed it, but <laughs> not killed it. And, you know, we're not going to get into the genres don't die. They just become less popular. True. Um, yeah, there's always somebody out there that will still yeah. listen to something. Rock is not you know? going to die. It may never return to the pop charts. <laughs> Yeah. It's not going to die. Well, yeah, I've always said it's kind of more of a museum piece at this point, you know? Mm-hmm. It, who knows what's going to happen? It may, it may not. Um, I'm perfectly fine if it doesn't. I'm, I like obscure music, but it's just, it ama- back to the, the subject at hand, and I think this is going to be a standalone thing. Um, I, it just amazed me that there's the genre, there's the whole tradition that I never realized was a thing, and it's given me almost a respect for pop music. Because I hmm. get the point of it now. <laughs> you know? I, it, I mean, I'd it's about say there's providing different points inf- at different times. Uh-huh. Well, yeah. I mean, yes, it's a cash grab. But anything mainstream <laughs> is a cash grab. Um, Greg Graffin had a great quote in EC Rocker. If anybody, you know, in this area of the country remembers oh, man. that. Uh, they were interviewing him off the back of I think it, I want to I want to say it was Stranger Than Fiction or Recipe for Hate, and he said if you want to keep your music pure, stay in the garage. <laughs> you know, so anything that the record companies have their hand in is is a cash grab on some level. But you know, on the rock side, at least the artists write it, and it it is a an attempt to be authentic. It starts there. Um, I just never thought that pop had almost, um, a virtue to it. You want to entertain the audience. You want to give them a good time. You want it's, to win them over, as they said in yeah. the documentary. Um, it just, it just <laughs> is very eye-opening. I, I mean, 
are record companies even that influential these days well, anymore? anymore. I they're, mean, they're dinosaurs. Yeah. Now. They've been dinosaurs for a while. I don't um, even really know who uh, who the main influence is really anymore. Like, it, it, it feels like the music industry is in chaos. Well, that was the beautiful even thing before, about... Even before, even pre-COVID, you know? Well, that was the beautiful thing about the internet. And, and uh, I mean, I'm not going to... I've done my share, but I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to talk up file sharing. But what it did, it was, is it democratized everything. It made it so the artist could go direct to the fans now. You know, and you have things like anybody can put their music on on Spotify or iTunes. You have Bandcamp, which is exclusively independent artists. You don't need a record. I just company hope they anymore. can make a living at it. You know. Well, yeah. I mean. You have that that was the other down that was the bad thing about one of the bad things about file sharing is it removed the ability to make your a living off of record sales. Yeah. You have to make your your living off of live now. Um and or, now we don't have a live. Or find other ways, which a lot of on, a lot of online artists have found other ways of other side hustles. They just announced a uh a Lollapalooza this year is like a virtual Oh, that's like interesting. Four day, it's going to be free for the next four days starting tomorrow. With like, I I was kind of wondering why they didn't get some sets from the '90s in there, but they've got some going back a good ten, fifteen years, I think. Okay, so, so it's all archival archival stuff. Most of it is, I think. I think I'm there's some check that out. new things. Um, there was a, a German festival a while ago. I found out about that was all online too during the quarantine. Um, Really interesting stuff. Anyway, um, that's it for this little digression. I, this is going to be a standalone thing because it went on for yeah. like 20, 15 minutes. Um, oh, wow. Anyway, talk to you next week. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.